Well, welcome to 2016 and welcome to Cedar Ridge Christian Church. I want to welcome our uh, Sepulpa and Coeta campuses. Those of you that are watching this online, uh, glad to have you along with us today. Uh, if you've got your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That'll be kind of the passage we'll uh, be at here in just a minute or so. You have been reading and you've seen in the news every year about this time. There's the list of the top resolutions, New Year's resolutions. You know, we all make and we all have some kind of uh, thought, maybe not formal, maybe not something we've written down, but we all begin this time of year to think about some things that we're going to do different in the new year. And one of the lists that I saw rated these as the top five. The number, number five was to take up a new hobby. That's a pretty good thing. Number four was to make more money. The third most popular resolution was to improve relationships. Number two was to stop smoking. And the number one New Year's resolution, it seems to make the top of the list just about every year, was to lose weight. You know, that's probably uh, uh, on a lot of your lists right there. But there were some other resolutions that I found a little more interesting. These were a little probably less serious that uh, people made, individuals made. One of them I read was this, I've resolved not to do drugs anymore because I get the same effect just standing up really fast. So there's somebody. Or this one, I have resolved to live in my own little world because at least they know me here. All right. Uh, or this one, I've resolved to stay married because it is so great to find that one special person you want to annoy for the rest of your life. All right. Yeah, some of you have made that one. Uh, I have resolved to not make any resolutions because nobody is perfect. I'm a nobody. Therefore, I'm perfect. Well, with the new year, we all begin to think about those kinds of things. We do a little reflection on the past year, and we begin to think about some goals for the coming year, and even talk about maybe some habits that we would like to instill into the new year. We start fresh, and what I love about that is that is so, well, that's so biblical. That, that's so Christian uh, for us to think about things being new. In fact, that verse that I had you look up, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, at least down in verse verse 17, almost sounds like a New Year's kind of a thing. It says, therefore, the Apostle Paul talking, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. The Apostle Paul is talking about somebody that becomes a believer in Jesus, someone that is in Christ Jesus, somebody that has accepted him, received him into their life, and is living now as a new Christian. He says, if anyone is like that, the new creation has come. New has come into you. The old is gone. The new has come. It's a wonderful thing to talk about, not just a change in calendar, what the Apostle Paul is talking about is a change in residence of who used to be in your life and now who is living there now. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Some of you can experience that. For many of you, maybe it was decades ago. For some of you, just in this past year, you understand you were baptized into Jesus and you you felt new. You felt like this fresh start. You were beginning a new beginning. But a question that we need to ask that some passages behind this kind of follow up and tell us is, why did this happen to you? What, what do we learn from this? Well, let's talk about verses 18 and 19. It says, all this, what we just talked about, what we just read, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. What, what do we learn from that passage? It seems to restate it at least a couple of times. One of the things that we learn is that all of this is from God. If you're a, a Christian, it is a God thing. It is something that God has done. God is behind. He is the driving force behind the redemption of mankind. He is the one that initiated the reconciliation. It comes solely at his initiative. This is not something that any one of us said, you know what, I, I think I have a, uh, a desire to get to know God. Uh, we may have come to that point, but it comes at God's uh, leading. It is something that God has initiated. Uh, we are reconciled with God and it comes from him. But notice it says he reconciled us to himself 
through Christ. The passage tells us that it was the work of Jesus Christ. It was through his death that that God was able to reconcile us to himself. That it is Christ alone that is the means of reconciliation. In fact, Jesus himself said, I am the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it is through Jesus that we have any hope of a relationship with God. And that's, again, what we've experienced. Those of us who who find ourselves as believers, God reached out to us, and through the work of Jesus, his righteousness allowed us to be right before God. So what does that mean for us? Well, the reason that happened is, according to the Apostle Paul, is that we would now have the ministry of reconciliation. It says it again, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You have been reconciled to God so that you can be a reconciler, so that you can be that person who helps reconcile other people to God. You are actually partnering with God. God continues to work through us, and he has given us this incredible privilege and responsibility to share in this this enterprise that he has of of trying to win the world to himself, to call others to be reconciled to him. We become his partners. The Apostle Paul then winds this passage up, verse 20, with saying this, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though we were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And so what the Apostle Paul is, is gives us some identity here. He's saying basically what that means is you become an ambassador of Jesus. God makes his appeal through us. You know what an ambassador does. In fact, an ambassador in our day is very similar to one in the Apostle Paul's day when this was written in the first century. There might be some differences in the fact that we probably have more career type uh, ambassadors and envoys these days, but but, uh, still the same idea is there. It's someone who represents. It's someone who speaks on behalf of somebody else, the, 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 the government that they're, they're representing. It's somebody that establishes a, a line of communication. It is a person that tries to bring nations together. And so this is what Paul is saying is you are God's ambassador, Christ's ambassador. You are making that appeal on behalf of God to the people around you. It's an identity thing. In fact, we're historically as Christians uh, pretty good at making a big deal about what we should do, what we Christians need to do, what we ought to do. I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul here is making more of an emphasis about who we are. Who we are is important because what we do emanates from who we are. It emanates from our identity. Our behavior flows from identity instead of the other way around. Because we spend too much time trying to tell people what they need to do when Paul says, listen, this is who you are. And if you get who you are, then the other part comes naturally. In fact, you've seen it in some funny Geico commercials lately. They've had this uh, uh, theme of it's what you do. And so that becomes their, their uh, kind of tagline for some of these latest commercials. One of my favorite is the one where the guys are out golfing and the sea monster, the kraken, comes out and, and the golf commentators are still whispering in their low voice even though all this activity is going on and I don't think a nine club is going to be big enough. And, and uh, you know, pretty funny deal. But the, the tagline is, if you're a golf commentator, you whisper. It's what you do. It's tying behavior with identity. There's another one that says, if you're a fisherman, you tell tales. It's what you do. Uh, There's another one that says, if you're the guy from the operation game, you get operated on. It's what you do. The emphasis is on behavior emanating from who you are. Because of who you are, you act in a certain way. So here's the point. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're an ambassador. You're you're a representative of Jesus. That's how God sees you. He sees you as his ambassadors, representing him, representing Jesus, making disciples. So listen, making disciples, representing Jesus is not just something we do. It's who we are. 
It's, it's the core of, of who we are. It, it, it's not just a, a, a church leader thing. It's not something we designate to certain people that this is what you're supposed to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is who you are. It's not just for those who are gifted. It's not just for those who feel comfortable. In fact, unfortunately, we know statistically that 98% of Christians in the United States do not share their faith. I think it comes down to an identity thing. We know it's something we ought to do, but we've never identified ourselves as somebody that that's who we are. Of course, we all would um, at least relate to it being something hard to do because of, of fear or, or maybe because we're shy. Or in some cases, we, we say we don't know how, we don't know what to do. And unfortunately, I think in some cases, there are people who call themselves Christians that just don't care. Either don't care about the lost or don't think that they're lost in some way. But, but this passage reminds us that this is, this is an identity thing. This is something of who we are. And so this is kind of my summary of what we just read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That God is reconciling himself to us through Christ to give us the message of reconciliation. And so this is, this is the bottom line. You've come to know God to help others know God. You have come to know God to help other people know God. That's nothing new to Paul's message in 2 Corinthians 5. In fact, it's a thread that we see throughout the history of the Bible, that you have been reconciled so that you can reconcile others. You have been blessed so that you can uh, be a blessing to others. You have been told so that you can tell others. We, we continue to see this helping people come to know who God is in fact, we can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We get to day 6, and he creates more than that. It says God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. So what is God asking his creation, his prized creation, to do? Well, to populate and to fill the earth, but notice it's not just a physical population. What God is desiring is that we would populate the earth with his image. If we're the bearers of the image of God when we're fruitful and we increase, then we bear God's image. We fill the earth with God's image. That's what he asks is his, his prized creation to do. Of course, we get to Genesis chapter 3, and we recognize that sin enters into the world, and, and uh, it creates this rift between God and, and mankind. And it gets so bad that Genesis chapter 6 and 7 and 8, we've got a flood that comes and wipes out all the world except for Noah and his family. Genesis chapter 9, Noah and his family walk out of the boat, and God says to them basically the same thing. Be, be fruitful. Fill the earth. The implication is fill the earth with my image. Let my, let my glory and my image be known. But it's not just another couple of chapters later, Genesis 11, that uh, some people gather together and say, hey, let's build a city and let's build a tower that reaches up to the heavens so we can make our name for ourselves and so we won't be scattered about the earth. I mean, in direct violation to what God has asked his people to do to, to be fruitful and to bear his image and his name and his glory across the earth. And they're saying, nope, let's, let's gather. Instead of scatter, let's, let's stay together and we'll, we'll defy what God asks us to do. Well, it's not too much longer. We get to Genesis chapter 12 and God begins to build a, a special family, a special nation through a guy named Abraham. And he says, I want you to leave your family and I want you to leave your country and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great. And listen, and you will be a blessing. Abraham was blessed so that he could be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, says God, and whoever curses you, I will curse you. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God's plan for the Israelite nation is that they would, they would be a, a witness of God's power and God's might and God's name and God's glory and God's image, that they would, that they would be that, and ultimately that would be the case through, through Jesus. But if you have read through the Old Testament or heard the stories, you come across story after story there. They're not just isolated events. Many of them are stories of God's people being a blessing to the 
countries or the nations or to the people around them, like Joseph when he's taken away in slavery to Egypt. And he becomes a blessing. He becomes a, a, a witness for God uh, to the Pharaohs and to the people of Egypt. And, and even when God's people aren't obedient and aren't, aren't proclaiming his name, God disperses them. God puts them in, in far reaches of the world. They, go to, they get taken to other nations, and, 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 and there they become witnesses, like a guy named Daniel, to the Babylonian and Persian empires. Remember Daniel in the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And after those events, they, they, they were witnesses of God's incredible, miraculous power. And sometimes the kings even said, everybody will bow down at the name of of God. And so we read story after story of exactly this, of God's people who choose to be allowing their blessing, their relationship with God to bless other people and bring them in to a relationship with God. It's not just in the historical parts of the Old Testament. We read it in the poetry. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. Be blessed so that your ways may be known on earth, so that God's name would be known. It's not just in the poetry part of the Bible. It's in the prophets. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God of the Lord as, as the waters cover the sea. That is God's plan that the world would know him, that he, the world would be filled with a knowledge of him and a knowledge of his glory. That's exactly what, what God wants, and he's wanted it from the very beginning. And he wanted it so bad that he sent Jesus to be a part of this world, to reconcile this world back to him. In fact, we know Jesus lived and, and he taught and he did miraculous things and ultimately he would die an atoning death so that we could be reconciled to him. And before he ascended back into heaven, he gave us special instructions to those of us that know him and have been reconciled to God through him. He said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And so we have this command to go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to, to be obedient. In fact, in a very similar passage, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he tells his disciples that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the church began and did a great job of, of reaching to Jerusalem. But even the early church didn't do a good job of reaching beyond. And so we get to Acts chapter 8 verse 1 and a great persecution takes place. And we're told that, that Christians are scattered to Judea and Samaria, the places around Jerusalem. And again, God's, God's name through Jesus Christ is being spread. That's God's plan to ultimately the end of time so that he can, as, as Revelation tells us, be with his people. So our leadership over this past year has gone to great effort to try to refine and, and zero in on, on what our mission as a church is. And we began to look at lots of things and how we, we might come across. What, what is it that God desires for us? What, what is it from looking at, at, at Scripture and this, this uh, thread throughout the Bible of, of what God calls His people to do? We began to, to study the Bible together. We began to call in some people and ask to, to teach us and help us understand a little more clearly. We began to look at some of the history of our church, the creation stories of Cedar Ridge Christian Church. And we began to talk about some of the memorable moments of, 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 uh, uh, of having faith and building buildings and adding campuses. And we began to talk about some of those stories. Then we began to talk about, you know, what is our local predicament? What are the things that, uh, that, that 
uh, are taking place in the communities around our campuses to which God has called us and God has, has placed us. And, and, and what is our collective potential? What, what, what are the people who, who are members of our church, who are part of this church family? What, what's the potential that we have when we come together? What are the things that, that, that we bring to the table? And then we begin to talk about what's our heartbeat and what, what's our passion. We begin to explore, explore lots of things. In fact, you helped us with some of that and some of our congregational meetings talking about, about who we are and what are some of the dreams and aspirations that we have. And so we begin to begin to compile all of that, that data and all of that input and begin to talk about what, what is it that God has called us specifically to do. We're, we're a people that like to help. We're a people that like to get our hands dirty. We're a people that like to, to help other people. We're a people that like to, to assist the vulnerable. We, we care about future generations. We care about lost people and then coming to know God. And we began to, again, to take all of that information and begin to explore what is it that we would call our mission and this is what we've come up with. We've, we've, we've had some different statements through the year. We wanted to be caring people who make a difference. And we want to be a, an environment where people can come to know God and experience community and make a difference. So we've had some things, but we said that we need something simpler. We need something that, that is more direct than that. And so this is, what, this is what we've talked about. Our mission being simply this, helping others follow Jesus. I love the simplicity of it. I love the helping aspect of it. And I love the directness of it. We're not called to, to do lots of things. We're called really to do one thing, and that's to help people follow Jesus. So when we talk about what's our church about, it's about helping others follow Jesus. It's, it's what we do. It comes down to us saying we're going to be about what Jesus called us to do, and that's to make disciples. That's our mission. Helping others follow Jesus. It's not primarily doing good things. It's not about just serving other people. It's not helping the poor. It's, it's not helping with foster situations or help. The, all of those are good things. And all of those things are things that we'll continue to be involved with. Those are all things that people of faith do. But those alone are incomplete. Listen, we, we could feed all the poor in the Tulsa County. We could feed all the poor in the world, and that still not do what God has called us to do. In fact, I, I was talking with some local pastors. Uh, they were all at one church here locally. We were at a, a kind of a ministerial alliance meeting together, and they began to tell me about some really neat things that they were doing to serve the community, different programs and events. And so I began to just you know talk about some of those things. I said, "Well, how are you how are you using that uh, to to be able to make disciples?" Their comment to me was. We, we, we don't do any of that. We, we, we just serve the poor. We just help people in those kinds of situations. That's, that's what we, we do. It's all about that. There are no strings attached. I, I understand that to a degree. But if all we as a do as a church is to feed the poor or to help the needy or to whatever, we have missed the primary calling that God has placed upon us. And that's been his calling from the very beginning to make his image and his name known to the people around us. It's, it's got to be more than that. Our primary task has to be to help people follow Jesus. L listen, it's a, it's a big job even in our area. I know we look at the Tulsa area sometime and think, oh, there's so many churches. There's a church on every corner. And, and there seems to be a lot of talk about Christianity. But you realize, at least from some of the statistics that we hear, as few as 19% of people in the Tulsa metropolitan area attend church on any given Sunday. 19%. For friends over at our Coweta campus, Wagner County, it drops to 5.8%. Only 5.8% only people attend church any given Sunday. This is a need. This is a huge thing. Even right here close to us, of how do we figure out how to help others follow Jesus? It's going to require some change in thinking for us. It's going to require some change in how we, how we function and how we measure 
our success. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. I don't know that this is an exhaustive list, but there's going to require a shift in thinking of people coming instead of us, uh, a shift now of going. Because, because that's been kind of the traditional mindset of the church, at least in the last few decades, is that you come to us and we'll give you the message of reconciliation. You show up, you attend one of our worship services that happen, you know, only a certain few hours of the week, and you'll be able to hear more about what we have to offer. We've got a shift from come to us, come and see, to go like Jesus told us. That was his directive. Go and make disciples. It was never when people show up, you all come. It was never that. In fact, we know statistically that 60% of lost people will not attend a worship service. They, won't just, they just won't go to church. In fact, it's, 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 it's way different from the 1950s when that uh, amount was 1%. 1% of people would not, which meant 99% of people were, were available and might attend a church service. But now it's 40%. 60% will not attend a worship service. But listen to this. 89% of them would let a believer tell them about their faith. 61% of those people who won't attend would be willing to study the Bible with a friend. There is an openness to spirituality and an openness to God, but it doesn't look like it has looked in the last few decades at the church. We've been what we call attractional. We try to get people to show up, and we've got to change from being attractional to being more missional, to going into the world. Now, we, we need to do both, but our strategy cannot be limited to just the people that are going to show up which is a little reason why we have been interested in being a part of our communities, why uh, our, uh, being a community church is so important to us. Instead of you know, growing as a, a big regional church, we said, you know what, let's, let's start a campus in, in uh, Sepulpa. Let's start a campus in Kuwait. And we're open to starting other campuses as God leads us because we want to be more of a community church whose members are living out their faith in the, the community and the neighborhood around them and who are sharing their faith in the community around them. We want to go into the communities around us. It means a shift from come to us and we go instead to them. The other shift would be something like this, from seating to sending. That we would go from thinking mostly about how many people we can get to come into a seat to being a sending organization, a sending church. Very closely related to that whole come and go thing. Uh, but the, the, the seating part of that is, uh, again, traditionally, is what we have measured is, uh, um, success-wise, is how many people we can get to come to church. How many seats we can have. How many people we can have in those seats. And we basically said that if you get lots of people in those seats, that, that that's a successful church. When, in fact, you could have lots of people in seats and you not be doing the very thing that God has called us to do. Listen, we want to go from not just a church that's concerned about our seating capacity, but to one who is worried about our sending capacity. We don't want to be just as inter we don't want to be just interested in being a growing church. We want to be a disciple making church. In fact, we're told that 96% of church growth, that means what they count as our church is growing, 96% of that is from people transferring from another church. That would certainly fit in line with what our church has experienced. Uh, uh, lots of our growth, lots of our new people have come from, from other churches. There's nothing wrong with that except in the fact that's not what Jesus has told us to do, to put our efforts into. L listen, if, if we make disciples, we'll get the church. That's just going to happen naturally. We don't have to worry about the seating if we do the sending. In fact, look at this passage in 2 Timothy 2.2. It reminds us of how this process works. Paul says, the things that you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, he's saying this to Timothy, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Notice, Paul is talking to 
uh, witnesses who talk to reliable people who will teach others. There's kind of a four-generation thing that's going here. And so what Paul is reminding us is this is how disciples are made. Disciples aren't made by showing up in a church building and somehow hearing a mass message and they, they grow and, and move on from there. Paul says this happens from a relational thing of people sharing their faith and sharing Jesus with others. And then that person makes a disciple and that disciple makes a disciple. It becomes this, this domino effect of people sharing their faith with others. It's not just people showing up to church to get saved. It's people sharing their faith individually who share their faith to other people to trust in Jesus. Okay, one more shift. Let's talk about this one. The shift from knowledge to obedience. We have got to make a shift. If we're going to be a, a, a people who help others to follow Jesus, it means we have got to be more interested in obedience than just our knowledge. That, that our application of, of Scripture, our obedience to Scripture is got to surpass just gathering information. There is a difference between being a church member and being a follower, a disciple of Jesus. And what it comes down to is this thing of obedience. Because here's what happens in our, our American Christian culture. We can, we can think that if we've immersed ourselves into the Christian culture, that means if I'm involved in a Bible study and I go to a good church and I listen to some Christian music and if I find a good Christian work environment, that somehow that that is being a good follower of Jesus, that that's being a good Christian. In fact, people usually tell me things like that. They tell me about, oh, I found such a good place to work. It's got lots of Christians there. And, you know, here's what I would love somebody to come up and tell me sometime. I have found the most pagan place to work at, and I'm so excited about being a witness there to the people around me. But instead, we have, we have missed this somehow, and, and, and we get more excited about being around Christian people. There's some good that ought to come out of that, but if we're obedient to Jesus, it means that we are, we are with people who don't know him. People who hear but don't do become inspiration junkies. I'm afraid that's what the American church has turned into. I mean, let's be honest. We get more excited, get more interested in another challenging, captivating Bible study, then we get to being obedient to Jesus' command. And so part of what we've done as a leadership is said, you know what, we want to be about helping others follow Jesus, and we want to be very clear about that, and we want to set some very clear goals. In fact, I'm going to share some more goals with you or another goal next week, but a part of this goal for us, a 10-year goal, is this, that we would have a 1,000 new believers. At the end of 10 years, this would be our goal, that we would have a 1,000 new converts. Not people that have joined the church. We're not talking about growing the church by a thousand. We're talking about people who have come to be new creations, who have, for the first time, begun to follow Jesus. Man, that, that, that's, a, that's a huge goal. It's an outrageous goal for us to think about that. It blows away anything that would be historical for us as far as, as, as helping people become new Christians. And that's, that's what we want to do. But what it's going to take is it's going to take an entire church engaging in the mission to help others follow Jesus. This isn't going to happen from the staff, from a few people, from a handful of leaders. It's not going to happen from just a few people doing it. It's going to take an entire church to say this is what we're about. I believe the church isn't moving because we have not trained ordinary believers to make disciples. We've not trained ordinary people to, to be a part of this. And you might be saying, I, I don't know how. I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I would like to. And in fact, that's what some of you told us in some meetings that we've had in the last six months. We, we want to be trained. We want to, we want to know how to do that. We want to feel competent in being able to share our faith and to, to be able to make uh, uh, disciples. We, we want to be able to be able to do that. And so we want to equip you to do that. And 
And I want to tell you about some stuff that we're going to be doing. In fact, I want to tell you about a workshop. We're calling it No Place Left. The No Place Left workshop. You've seen it advertised, maybe just kind of uh, not even known what it was. We've had it in the bulletin. We've had it in other means of, of communication. It's coming up January 22nd and 23rd. It's a Friday night, Saturday. And listen, we want everybody to participate in that. We want every adult to be there. We want every every teenager to be there. We're going to have stuff for the kids, younger kids to do, and even to participate a little bit with us. But we have... We have spent money and we have spent time and most of our leaders have already been through some kind of prequel to this training to help us get to this place where we help others follow Jesus. The whole reason behind the no place left is we want to be able to say there is no place left in Broken Arrow. There's no place left in Tulsa where people have not heard the chance, have not had the chance to hear about Jesus. There's no place in Coweta left. No place left in Sepulpa where people have not heard about Jesus. No place left in your neighborhood or in your school or at your workplace that is not heard. Jesus. That's what we want to be, is helping people. And listen, if, if you call yourself a part of the Cedar Ridge family, if you're committed at all to this church, I, I'm asking you to be a part of this training to help us do this thing of helping others follow Jesus. Read an article in the paper a few years ago. The headline said this, Michigan postal worker hoarded thousands of pieces of mail instead of delivering them. Uh, Jill Hull was a postal worker. She pleaded guilty to deserting the mail. And I guess what happened is she just had a storage unit that she chose not to deliver the mail, and she just kept putting it in there and kept putting it in there and kept putting it in there. And it was only after she failed to pay her bill that the, uh, the uh, storage managers opened up her storage unit and discovered thousands of pieces of unopened mail, dating back years, first class mail, and then just junk mail, uh, postmarks from way back. And I guess after the story broke, some people humorously were coming into her post office and asking, can I pick up my mail or is that in storage? It's hard for us to imagine a post office and its employees not doing the very thing that they're supposed to do to deliver mail. That's their job. I mean, that's, that's what you do. How could you not do that? Well, it happens when people lose sight of the mission. It doesn't just happen in post offices. It happens in businesses and government offices and classrooms, and it also happens in the church. Listen, if you're a postal worker, deliver the mail. It's what you do. And if you're a follower of Jesus, help others follow him. This year, help others follow Jesus because it's what we do. Pray with me. Father, we're so thankful that you have reconciled us to yourself. We are so thankful for the work of Jesus in bringing us to you and making us right before you. And Father, we maybe have not been as clear about what that means to us, that we become people who carry a message of reconciliation. And Father, help us then to be that people. Help us to understand who we are so it changes what we do. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.